Okay. Um, so, whew, this was some like riveting material this week, huh? Um, last time, uh, last time uh, when we chatted, we were sort of hanging out with the E story uh, of what happened at the mountain and in the wilderness, uh, laws, covenant, some light idolatry. Uh, and this time we're going to dive fully into P's version, the priestly, the priestly vision. Uh, and of course, it could hardly be more different. Uh, the P story has no uh, no tablets uh, and no calf. Um, it doesn't know anything about Ten Commandments. Uh, there is no covenant made at at Sinai. Uh, and you know, as usual, I think it's sometimes hard, especially in these what we think of as sort of like crucial moments in the story. It's hard to get our heads around the idea that the episodes that make up our idea of the biblical story weren't always part of it. Uh, but of course, that's the whole point of, uh, of reading these things uh, in isolation and separate. So we get to see a whole variety of, uh, of ways that people thought about and imagined and uh, constructed uh, these, these moments. So if P doesn't have any of that good stuff, um, like the tablets and the Ten Commandments and the Golden Calf, uh, what, what does it have? So in P's view, uh, what happened on top of Mount Sinai was literally nothing other than Yahweh giving Moses the blueprint for the tabernacle. Uh, and that's it, folks. Uh, just building instructions, not even directions on how to use the tabernacle once it's built. Uh, that, th that content, those instructions uh, are what make up the book of Leviticus. Uh, so I guess stay tuned for me to do Leviticus, I think later this spring. Um, uh, now I, I realize that uh, the tabernacle texts uh, at the end of Exodus are what we might call relatively dry reading. Uh, unless of course you're like an engineer or an architect, in which case it's probably less dry, but perhaps more infuriating uh, because you can't really figure out how this thing is intended to be put together. Not exactly. Uh, and we should probably recognize uh, that this has always been dry reading, probably. I don't, I don't know that the ancient readers were or, or audience were like so desperate to hear, uh, you know, how many sockets and, uh, and how many curtains. Um, so the question that we should be asking ourselves uh, when we encounter material like this is, is why? Why have this in here at all? Why all of this extraordinary detail? And why even have it twice, right? Once in the instructions, and then once in the report of the actual building of the thing. And so I will remind us all of my point uh, from last time. We really want to pay close attention to where the narrative and the text slows down. And here, of course, the story doesn't just slow down, it sort of grinds to a near halt. The amount of text about the tabernacle here, just the chapters, you know, just Exodus 25 through 31 and 35 through 40, that amount of text is equivalent to roughly 80% of all of the rest of P that has preceded it from creation in Genesis 1 to here, which means this stuff must be pretty darned important for the priestly writers. Now, sure, we can understand uh, why the tabernacle or the temple or whatever cultic space would be important for a priestly writer. This is, of course, where they make their living in, in these cultic spaces. But that's, that's not all of it. The most important point about the tabernacle is that it was understood in the priestly texts, at least, in, in the mind of P, not just as the site of cultic ritual activity, but as the home of Yahweh. And I mean that not in some metaphorical sense, the actual, literal, physical home, right? This is God's house. And, you know, Yahweh says this right from the very beginning of, uh, of what, we, what we read this week. Um, the first thing is supposed to happen is you're supposed to gather up all of these various materials and let Israel make me a sanctuary. 
says God. Why? Not just as a place for them to worship, so that I can dwell in their midst. Now, this is not in the story, this is not some new idea that God has suddenly had, like, ooh, I've got, I've got a bunch of people in the wilderness. I'll keep them busy by having them build me something. Now, this, as it turns out, was the, the point of the whole thing. Right? I will abide among the Israelites, and they shall know that I, Yahweh, am their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. This was why God took Israel out, in God's own words. So uh, spend you know, a, a brief moment thinking about this. We might contrast this with what we saw in E last week, uh, where you want to see God. It's not so hard. It's regular and relatively easy. You just build an altar. Right? You remember from the very beginning of the, of the covenant code. Uh, make for me an altar, and wherever you do that, I'll uh, I'll come to you and bless you. But if in this situation, obviously, God isn't just hanging around all the time. Right? God is somewhere else, and you can sort of summon God with sacrifices. Uh, here in the priestly story, there is no summoning God with sacrifices, uh, in part because the sacrifices happen directly in front of the deity, uh, as we'll see. But if E imagines a deity who lives elsewhere and comes sometimes to visit, P imagines a deity who lives in like the mansion on the central town green. P spends so much time on this building because what could possibly be more important? This is the literal home of God. It is the center of all priestly activity. It's where Yahweh communicates with Israel. It's the place that, through the divine presence in it, safeguards Israel's well-being. And for P, at least, this is all there is, right? All divine activity takes place here. This is where God is located. There is no sense here of, you know, sort of God is everywhere. God is not omnipresent for P. God, Yahweh is not in every blade of grass or, or whatever, right? And we should remember this is the same writer, the same author who gave us Genesis 1, right? Which is so often associated with this sort of distant magisterial deity who causes things to come into being through speech, right? That same author who has that distant, seemingly distant deity in creation, it, that's the same author that has that same deity literally dwelling physically in the midst of humanity, which I, I suppose is a reminder that we shouldn't pigeonhole these writers as if, uh, or these, these thinkers uh, as if, you know, oh, you could only have, you know, one kind of idea, right? They, they clearly have a, a sort of complex and robust notion of the deity that encompasses both a God who creates the entire world from speech and who then wants Israel to build him a house so that he can stay in it forever. So once we have in mind that the tabernacle that is the center of these chapters is not just a cultic space, is not just a sanctuary, but is in fact the home of God, the, the house of the deity, um, I think that helps frame it as we as we move ahead and take a look at the actual structure, and at least try and understand a little. Uh, since, of course, P spent so much time on this thing, uh, that's the least we could do. And again, I realize, of course, that when we tell the Exodus story, and even I guess for the most part, when we read the Exodus story, uh, we get to the moment at Sinai, and maybe in the back of our heads we know that there's a building thing that happens, but we sort of you know like we skip ahead. We skip through the instructions to the golden calf, and then we skip from there to, I don't know, somewhere in the middle of numbers, probably. Um, but again, if we're going to take the Bible seriously and the book of Exodus seriously, it would be quite strange to sort of just ignore, uh, you know, a full third of it uh, or more. My math is not very good. I think it's about a third. Uh, so the tabernacle. Here is 
a relatively decent sketch of it, at least the one that I'm going to be uh, uh, using as my uh, as my regular sort of uh, uh, my regular scheme of the thing as we move along. Um, when we read Exodus 25 through 31, the instructions for the making of the tabernacle move from the innermost to the outermost. Uh, it starts with the most holy stuff, so it begins with the uh, with the ark, and then it uh, and then it expands outward from most holy to least holy. I am going to go the other way, uh, sort of just for fun, and sort of because this is, we're going to we're going to almost walk through the tabernacle together. Uh, that's that's my plan here. So as we look at the blueprint, uh, let's notice that we have a very big courtyard around a relatively small central building. Um, and we're going to enter that courtyard from the east, as one was meant to do. It's where the door is. And the first thing we encounter in this courtyard is uh, the large altar. Uh, I was very proud of myself for figuring out how to make things on this map glow. Um, so we have this large altar. Uh, and the description of that altar we get in Exodus 27. Uh, most of the details in here aren't particularly important, uh, at least not for our purposes. They're all obviously incredibly important for the priestly authors, but I can't do everything. Um, so we have the altar, which is made of wood. We have its uh, dimensions. Uh, and uh, what I want to point out here, just as a, a brief thing to keep our eye on, is that it's made. it's covered in copper. And whether we are uh, aware of it when reading or not, one of the ways that the relative uh, gradients of holiness in the tabernacle are signaled is by the precious metals that are used uh, to plate them. So here out in the open in the courtyard where the public can just wander around, uh, we've got stuff that's made of copper. Uh, as we move inside the tabernacle structure, uh, everything suddenly becomes gold. Uh, this altar, uh, there are two altars, uh, and this one, the larger one, is the sacrificial altar, uh, as you can tell from its implements, uh, pails for removing ashes, scrapers, basins, flesh hooks, fire pans, uh, gross, kind of. Uh, how do you use this altar? Uh, I don't know yet, because the text doesn't tell us how to use it. Again, the what we're going to do with any of this stuff uh, is what Leviticus is for. But again, right, this makes sense in terms of the genre of the text we're reading. Uh, what God is giving Moses here are blueprints, not the user manual. The blueprints are given first uh, on the top of Sinai, and the user manual is given at the bottom of Sinai from within this very structure. Uh, Leviticus will make clear, of course, that all of the sacrifices are offered on this altar. All of that space in the courtyard, that's all for the business of animal sacrifices. They're slaughtering and draining blood and removing skin and cutting up the flesh. There's a lot to do when you're sacrificing uh, you know, large animals. Um, and not only is there a lot to do, but it's relatively messy as well, uh, which is why we have this other thing in the courtyard, uh, which is the basin. And there it is, uh, just uh, between the altar and the um, and and the sanctum, the the sort of structure in the middle there. Uh, here's the text about the about the basin. Again, you'll notice it's made out of copper, uh, and it is placed between the tent of meeting and uh, the altar. Uh, the basin, of course, provides a means of regular washing, which in a bloody animal sacrificial cult is a nice thing to have around. Uh, but also remember, this is God's house. Uh, God does not want the priests tracking blood inside when they come in, uh, which is why they're washing their hands and their feet. Especially the case since the stuff out there in the courtyard is less pure and less holy than the stuff that's inside. So you want to get all of that not quite so holy stuff off of you before you, uh, before you come inside. So that's all there is in the courtyard of the tabernacle. It's just an altar and a basin, at least in terms of the, uh, the major implements that are mentioned here. But you know, that's the vast majority of the functional space of the tabernacle structure. 
And that's the only part that most Israelites would ever encounter because regular Israelites, as long as they're pure, are allowed into the courtyard where the sacrifices take place. They might not be able to touch anything, but they can certainly watch. This is public space because the priestly ritual is fundamentally a public one. Before we move into the, the sanctum itself, the, 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 the main chamber here, we should take a moment to talk about the priests. Uh, since perhaps somewhat oddly at first, the instructions for the priests clothing and for their anointing are also in these chapters. Uh, starting in chapter 28, bring forward your brother Aaron to serve and uh, with his sons to serve me as priests and make vestments for them. So why does Moses need to get not just blueprints for a building, but also all this stuff about priests? Uh, why is this considered part of sort of the blueprint genre, as it were? And the, basically, it's because the priests are part of the tabernacle complex. What's being laid out for us here isn't just building materials. It's also all of the holy things that belong to Yahweh and his house. Priests are holy. And the priests, at least in their role as priests, belong to the house. They're servants. They are Yahweh's cooks and cleaners. Uh, and their clothing is not just, uh, you know, pretty stuff to look at. Uh, it's also functional too. So I'm going to go through it uh, a little bit because, uh, I don't know, it's fun. Uh, so the priests have this thing called the ephod. And it's a shame that I had to start with this because I don't know exactly what it is. It's some, it's some kind of, of priestly garment. Uh, I'll get to a picture in a little bit. Uh, but it's got stones with the names of the tribes uh, on it. So take stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. Uh, six on one stone and six on the other. Uh, and, uh, and those go onto the shoulder pieces. These stones with the names of the tribes is so that Yahweh remembers when the priests come uh, into, the, into the sacred space, who they're representing. Again, it's a, it's a public cult. It's just carried out by a specialized um, sort of group of people. But this, these stones make Israel present during the cultic rituals, even when it's just the priests doing the rituals themselves. Now, if you are uncomfortable with the idea that God requires rem being reminded of stuff, uh, then this might not be the Bible for you. Uh, this is a thing that happens all over the place, but particularly in, in P, there's a whole series of moments that uh, in which uh, God needs to set up reminders for himself um, so that he doesn't forget uh, things. This goes all the way back to the flood where the rainbow uh, is, is a sign not for people, but for God to remember to shut the rain off. Okay, so... Uh, They've got the ephod with the, uh, the shoulder pieces, with the stones, with the Israelites' names on them. They've also got a breast piece uh, hanging down from the ephod, which also has the names of the tribes engraved on it. Uh, so it's doing some of the same function, uh, but it's also got an, another purpose. Uh, notice what this, this implement is called. It's called the breast piece of decision. And that's because it contains the semi-mysterious Urim and Tumim. Uh, I think they're actually not so mysterious in terms of what they do. Uh, it's just that they've been weirdly translated uh, for a long time, at least in certain, I don't know, university seals and crests. Uh, uh, Urim and Tumim does not mean light and truth or lex et verita, lux et veritas. Um, uh, as, as some people's uh, employers and alma maters uh, may have it. Uh, I will admit, we're not exactly sure what these words mean, um, but we know what they are, sorry. Uh, the Urim and Tumim are oracular instruments. Uh, they are a, a, a way for the priests to uh, divine the divine will, as it were. Uh, probably it was something like casting lots. Uh, so people would, you would consult the Urim and Tumim. And this is a thing that we see actually elsewhere outside of the priestly text as well. 
All of which is, I think, a nice reminder that the priests in ancient Israel, even in the priestly text, uh, weren't just killing animals and smearing their blood all over the place. The priests were understood to be people who had a special access to the deity. Uh, and again, this is not, not confined to, uh, to the priestly text, it's, it's all over. Uh, this is of course a place where the roles of priest and prophet converge and probably were contested. Uh, you'll remember, uh, or maybe not, uh, E gives exactly this oracular function to Moses the uber prophet, the proto prophet, um, whereas P assigns it to the, to the priests. Uh, there are, there's a whole series of other priestly garments. I'm gonna went, mention uh, just one more because I think it's a fun one. And that's the robe uh, with its bells all around the bottom. What's the point of having bells around the bottom of uh, the priest's robe? Uh, there have been some uh, relatively entertaining uh, theories uh, brought up about this going back to antiquity. I think the answer is actually relatively simple uh, once we have in mind, uh, again, what this structure actually is. Uh, it may be a bit challenging to our modern understandings of the deity, but uh, this is Yahweh's house. You don't just walk in unannounced. The bells on the priest's garment are effectively the doorbell. They're the warning to the deity that Aaron, the high priest, is about to enter. Uh, and if, again, I keep on coming back to these sorts of things. If you're, if you're like, if you're wondering how is it that God could possibly be surprised, right, that doesn't met, mesh with our understandings of God. Uh, that's because you're thinking like a Neoplatonist and not like an ancient Israelite. Uh, we're dealing here with a deity who is living in a house. Uh, the possibility of that deity being surprised doesn't seem so far outside of uh, outside of the, the norms established here. Anyway, for whatever it's worth, here is a depiction of the priestly garments. How accurate is it? Uh, I have no idea. Uh, I I will say, but I, mean, I can I recognize all the things. I see the aphod, which is the kind of uh, the thing with the shoulder plate, the shoulder pieces, and I see the breastplate, and I see the robe, and I see the little bells at the bottom. Uh, so in any case, I have no idea whether this is what it actually looked like. I do, I will admit, I find the lack of shoes disturbing. That's all I got on the priests for the moment. Okay. Since the priests get to go into the sanctum of the tabernacle exclusively, uh, so should we. Uh, and we're talking about this space highlighted here. Uh, now we're getting into territory, of course, that is exclusive to the priests. No lay Israelites are allowed in here. It is just too holy. Uh, only the priests can enter because they too are holy. Uh, and what do we find inside uh, this, uh, this outer chamber of the, of the tabernacle? Uh, three items and a mysterious curtain. Item number one is the lamp, otherwise known as the menorah. Uh, the description of the menorah uh, goes on for a while, uh, but here's really the main clause. Uh, you should make a lampstand of pure gold uh, and, and so on and so on about all its various bits and pieces. Now, I know some people who get very worked up about the feasibility of a large lampstand made out of pure gold. And I will admit I'm not one of them because I know nothing at all about metallurgy. So it doesn't bother me in the slightest. In any case, what is this lamp for? Uh, the same thing every lamp is for. It's for light, but light for whom? And this is where maybe it gets a bit stickier. Uh, surely, the priests need to see what they're doing in there, you'd think. But this is not a particularly high traffic area, even for the priests. They're not in there a lot, uh, and certainly not in there all day, but the lights are supposed to be on all day and all night. Um, could the light therefore be light for Yahweh? Again, 
it is his house after all. And there's further reason to think that the, the lamp is for, uh, is for Yahweh's benefit because the other main piece of furniture in here is the table. So what's up with this table in there? Again, you should make a table of acacia wood uh, and then you're gonna cover it in gold, a table of pure gold, presumably too heavy to carry. So we just overlay it. Still an impressive piece of furniture, no doubt. Also, you'll notice all of its various implements, its bowls, ladles, jars, jugs, are all also made out of pure gold. That's, that's a lot of gold uh, to have in, in one room. I mean, honestly, like what kind of nut would want everything in his house to be totally gold? Uh, sorry. In any case, uh, this is a table with bowls and jars and jugs. And we should ask, who is eating off of this table? Well, you shall set the bread of display to be before me always. Uh, that might give us something of a clue as to who all of this stuff is for. Okay, so I am not necessarily, I'm not necessarily suggesting that the authors of the biblical text understood God to be literally consuming bread and wine from the table in the tabernacle but I wouldn't be so quick to assume that they didn't understand it that way either. As always, and seemingly especially in these chapters, as I'm finding the more I talk about it, we have to be careful to avoid imposing our own views of God back onto the biblical text. The idea that God didn't have a body or couldn't possibly require sustenance of any kind, much less the idea that God is omnipresent or omnipotent, these are ideas that showed up only centuries after most of the biblical texts were composed, and mostly not in this part of the world either. So whether we take it you know, literally or not, the idea of a table with bread and wine and implements and a lamp placed in the antechamber of God's house, literally or not, they're definitely evoking the image of Yahweh eating and drinking and requiring light. And that may feel very strange to us, but I don't think it would feel very strange to the ancient Israelites. Now, I will admit, the priests who entered that space would probably have known what was going on, right? It's their job to put bread on that table regularly, right? Once a week. And presumably at the end of the week, they would have seen the uneaten bread and, you know, had and, and replaced it uh, with, with new bread. So like, you know, they would have known that like there weren't bite marks in it or anything from, from, from the deity. And of course, this isn't a show for the rest of Israel because no one else could ever possibly see it. So it's not like the priests were trying to pull a, 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 you know, a fast one over on the lay people and pretending that this bread had been consumed. It is also though possible that they understood the deity to consume the bread in some unseen fashion, perhaps not so differently from how deceased ancestors perhaps consumed offerings left at a gravesite. The overall point is they're decorating a real home here. And as they understand Yahweh to be like a person, but better. So he's got a house like a person, but better with gold bowls and cups and lamps. Now, the last thing in this outer chamber of the sanctum is the incense altar. It is, of course, uh, you know, again, made of acacia wood and covered in gold. And as you know, as you will have noticed now, everything inside the sanctum is covered in gold and everything out in the courtyard was made of copper. The, 
you know, the function of an incense altar seems relatively straightforward, but we might look at this and some people might be wondering, um, what's going on with these horns on the altar? Uh, and in theory, this can be a, a little hard to picture, right? What does it mean its horns are made of one piece with it? Uh, like horns, horns? Uh, and this is a place where archaeology uh, is actually incredibly useful because uh, all over the, uh, you know, the area and, you know, broadly speaking around the ancient Near East, we have found uh, plenty of altars uh, in various contexts, and they all look basically like this. Uh, and again, I could have chosen like a whole range from a whole range of images. If you were, if you Google ancient Israelite altars, which is all I did to find this picture, uh, you will you'll see how many how many of these there are. So there's the horns, right? The little corners that that stick up. Uh, those are ubiquitous on all of these ancient uh, altars from this time and place. Uh, why are they there? I don't know. Evidently, it was the altar style at the time. Um, but in any case, that's the answer to what's up with these horns on the altar. And it gave me the opportunity to put this pretty picture up. Uh, now, obviously, the function of the incense altar is to burn incense. Uh, but why? Why does there need to be an altar of inside incense here inside uh, the tabernacle? Well, incense obviously is usually to make stuff smell nice. And the tabernacle probably smelled pretty bad. What with all of the killing and the blood and the burning going on in the courtyard. Again, this is Yahweh's house and it needs to be inhabitable. There is a, uh, a, a second, somewhat more secret use for the uh, for this incense altar, uh, but perhaps actually a, a better known one uh, on the uh, the the holiest day, the day when the high priest gets to go into the innermost sanctum, uh, what became the uh, Jewish uh, holiday of Yom Kippur. Uh, on that day, uh, the high priest is supposed to take some of the incense off of this incense altar in his little incense fire pan and carry it in in front of him uh, when he enters into the innermost sank, uh, innermost uh, room of, of the tabernacle. Uh, there, I think not for smell, but in fact, uh, quite clearly in the text, for the purpose of the smoke, which is uh, to block the priest from being able to see the deity who is sitting right there, potentially. Now that I've brought it up, let's go into that inner sanctum, uh, the Holy of Holies. Uh, this should be fun. Uh, once we step behind the curtain that separates the outer chamber from the inner chamber, we are in the space reserved exclusively for the high priest. Before I go on, I, I actually, I wanna comment briefly uh, on the idea of this space being exclusive to the high priest, not in a practical sense, but in a literary one, because there's something very cool going on here, which is the text that the priestly author is, is writing and has given us essentially grants its audience and readership access into spaces that are otherwise unseeable and unknowable to anybody else. The text is is doing work that reality couldn't offer, at least the reality is constructed uh, by by the priests. So even as what it feels it feels like this these chapters are just, you know, verse upon verse and chapter upon chapter of just incredibly dry material. But especially once we get inside the space that only the priests can go in, the more detailed, the better, right? That we're getting we're getting a a once in a lifetime opportunity, I realize we can reread it, but a once in a lifetime opportunity to sort of explore a space that is otherwise forever off limits to us. So the, the text is essentially bringing to its audience and making real for its audience uh, the, the otherwise unknowable. Uh, and so, you know, the detail is, is more than just descriptive. It's um, 
it's it's making this space present uh, and bringing the reader into it uh, in, in a pretty remarkable way. Okay, what we find inside, uh, what we find inside the Holy of Holies is shockingly the holiest object in the entire priestly world. And it is of course the Ark made of acacia wood overlaid with pure gold. Uh, this is, I should say, not the Ark of the Covenant, or at least it's not called that. That's what it's called in Deuteronomy, where it's quite a different object. And the priestly writings is never called the Ark of the Covenant. There's no covenant uh, associated with it. It is just the Ark. Um, what's an Ark? Uh, not the boat one from Noah, but as we know from the movies, the Ark is a box. It's a box made of wood and of course, obviously covered in gold. And on top of this box is a cover, which is often, but I'm going to tell you wrongly, called the mercy seat, uh, which I have to say is a phrase that has always rung very oddly to my ears, uh, perhaps because it has a particular Christian sound to it. Um, the, the cover on top of the ark has nothing to do with mercy. Uh, it's just a cover. And that's what the word being used means here. Uh, this is in fact, the very same word uh, that is used when Noah uh, is building the ark and he covers it in, in pitch, right? To seal it. Um, that's the, sa the same root that's being used here for, for this seat. Uh, Noah didn't show mercy to the ark, right? Just covered it. So uh, this is the cover of, of the ark, Just, you know, so flat, surface that goes on top of it. And on top of that cover are everybody's favorite, uh, the cherubs. I'm sorry, that's the wrong picture. Those are Christian cherubs. Uh, we want ancient Near Eastern cherubs that looked like this. Uh, much better, winged beasts with human heads, uh, not babies with wings. Uh, again, this is broad ancient Near Eastern um, uh, figures. Uh, with uh, show up in, in this is obviously perhaps not obviously this is uh, Mesopotamian uh, and uh, and these are all over the place uh, there were no babies with wings but there were lots of sort of these uh, these mixed creatures um, now these cherubs sit on top of the cover right and they touch their wings together so you're going to make two of these things um, one at one end and one at the other um, and they have their wings spread out above, shielding the cover with their wings, uh, and they're facing each other. Uh, here is, I think, a decent illustration of what this might have looked like, uh, with the exception, of course, of the fact that those cherubs are humans. You can tell they're like kneeling and seem to be wearing shoes, for God's sake. Um, uh, but you know, if you imagine them not as humans with wings, but as what the thing I just showed you a second ago, uh, you have a pretty good sense of, uh, of I think what is being imagined here with the, uh, these beings facing each other with their wings spread out on top of it. I will say it is ridiculously hard to find a good free online image uh, or reconstruction of, uh, uh, of the Ark, but this is not bad. So, in, in their stretching their arms out like this, you can see that they're effectively making something like a seat. Why is it useful for the cherubs to make a seat here above the ark? Well, the text is actually quite clear about what this space is for. God says, there I will meet with you and I will impart to you from above the cover, from between the two cherubs that are on top of the ark, all that I will command you concerning the Israelite people. So in other words, this, the space between the cherubs above the ark on top of the cover is the precise location from which Yahweh will communicate with Moses. And again, we are not in the land of metaphor. This is the inner sanctum of Yahweh's literal physical house. And this is where he sits or resides, right? This is his inner chamber. And in a sense, it's nothing more than that. Right? That's, what, that's what this room is. It is the, the place where God is. But 
That's plenty, right? That's more than plenty. This is essentially the deity's bedroom. Israel creates this space for their God to dwell in. And then they make sure that their God is comfortable in it. Or at least Yahweh makes sure with the rules he gives later that they are going to keep him comfortable. Okay, so if we understand everything that's in the tabernacle, let's jump ahead to Exodus 40, where the whole thing gets put together. And let's recognize how huge this moment is in the priestly story. The completion of the tabernacle takes place exactly to the day, one year after the departure from Egypt. So that's basically how long it takes them to make it. And while, of course, there is this, this guy named Bezalel uh, and the rest of the Israelites who contribute and help to make all of the various bits and pieces of the tabernacle, Moses alone sets the whole thing up. I mean, he does everything. Uh, the building, the setting the table, the putting out the bread, lighting the lamps, burning the incense. He even offers sacrifices. And then there's the key moment which is sort of the central moment for P's entire storyline. It is one of the two great climaxes of the entire priestly narrative. When Moses had finished the work, the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the presence of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. So a couple of comments about this verse. First, this is obviously the moment where Yahweh takes up residence uh, in, in his new home. And from now on, everything in P, almost everything, will be focused on the maintenance of this space. That's what all the sacrifices are. Join us for Leviticus later in the spring and I will explain all of it to you. <laughs> uh, but that it makes sense, right? Once your God dwells among you, your priority really needs to be keeping that God happy. Further, this moment is linked through the language being used to the creation of the world back in Genesis, where we also have the same noting of completion, right? When Moses had finished the work and on the seventh day, God finished the work and in Hebrew, they're even closer. This moment here in Exodus 40 is also linked back to the appearance of God on top of Sinai. So when Moses finishes here, the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the presence of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. Whereas back when God first shows up on the mountain, the cloud covered the mountain and the presence of Yahweh dwelt on Mount Sinai. In other words, the tabernacle has replaced Sinai as the primary locus of the divine presence. So in this moment, we've tied together creation and revelation and inhabitation. This is, as God explicitly said, the purpose of taking Israel out of Egypt. It was so that he could dwell among them. And from this point on, it's their responsibility to make sure that he doesn't leave. <laughs> 